door. Um, right. 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 Um, okay, Second Corinthians um, chapter seven, verses six to eleven. But God will encourage those who are those who are discouraged. Encourage us by the arrival of Titus. And his presence was a joy, but so was the news he he brought of the encouragement he, re he received from you. When he told us how much you longed to see me and how sorry you are for what happened and how loyal you are to me, I was filled with joy. I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. So you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly, worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance results in spiritual death. Just see what this godly sorrow produced in you. Such earnestness, such concern to clear yourselves, such indig indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal, and such a readiness to punish wrong. You showed, you showed that you have done everything necessary to make things right. Anybody like criticism? Nobody likes criticism, right? You think there's a difference, though, between that and constructive criticism? The weird thing is, we don't even like to hear constructive criticism sometimes. Even when we are seeking help, we're seeking direction, we're seeking guidance, and somebody says something to us that is helpful, sometimes we kind of... Uh, uh, so here we have a story about people that were behaving the way that God would have them behave. And somebody sent them a letter trying to give them a little bit of help, a little bit of guidance, and they didn't like it too much. But the author of that letter then says, you know, I didn't like having to send it to you, but now I'm glad I did. Because that letter helped them then to recognize their mistakes and make changes. Yeah, again, so like I said, we don't like sometimes, you know, some of the guidance that we get. We don't even like looking at our own mess sometimes, do we? We don't even like really digging deep and looking at all of the issues, all of the, the hurts, all of the, the behaviors that we had participated in and those behaviors that were put on us, right? The hurt, right? So we're going to be looking at step four, which tells us that we need to be what? Fearless. <coughs> we need to make a fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And fearless is a weird word. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Um, because I don't think we should ever be in fear, but we can't confuse that with things like concern and uh, yeah, we need to know that no matter what we have to face, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we're going to take a look at all of this this morning, but first let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your presence here with us, Father, and I pray, Lord, that as we look to your word, 
that you speak to each and every person here because there is a message for each and every person here, including myself. So help me, Lord. Help me to stay completely open to your leading, to your will, to your guidance. Speak to me, Father, the words that you would have me to know and apply to my life. And speak through me the words that you would have each person here in this room at this moment to know, to believe, and to apply to their lives. It's hard sometimes. But unless we really get honest with ourselves and deal with this mess, we're going to continue over and over again to come through facilities like this. And you want so much more for us. So help us, Lord, this morning to be honest and be fearless. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So we may... A searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And what does that mean, that moral inventory of ourselves? And again, you know, it's God as I understood him, right? So it's, it's, it might be different for some people than it is for others. See, because once we've come into a relationship with God, there's certain things that might change along that path. Because God will give us more and more information as we can handle that. And then it's up to us to make those changes as he points them out. Um, yeah, so those character defects and those shortcomings, they change. There might be some now, as you sit here today, that you think are okay. But as God continues to speak to you, if you maintain your relationship with him, and he, and he continues to speak to you, there will be more and more things as you walk. Because this is a process. This is a process. And, and, and unlike the first rehab I, I was in, and within, within um, the first 28 days of, of sobriety, I, you know, and first of all, in the 28-day program, really, I don't count days until you leave. But they expected us to do not only a step four, but a step five. <coughs> It's like, what's it going to include? Have you really had the opportunity to dig down deep and to take a look at what's going on? So again, there might be things today in your searching and fearless moral inventory, because there is something in all of our lives that we see that we need to change. It might be different. Your inventory might be different today than it will be tomorrow, but we need to remain fearless because it is scary sometimes it's in fact sometimes it can even be overwhelming um, to deal with some of the stuff that we've had to deal with or that we've been through right so what are some of the roadblocks I think the first roadblock is false pride and I won't call it pride, even though it is. We, we're proud men, right? We're men. So we let pride get in the way because of fear. Because people might know who we really are. Now, we know, even though we lie to ourselves sometimes. But God knows. God knows. So if this, is, this isn't where you know, we sit down with with another person in front of God and admit, we're not even there yet, we're just trying to, to determine, to really be honest with ourselves and take a look at what got us here. The problem is, of course, like I say, we, we try to act like we, we got it all together, we're big, strong men, but the truth is that we hurt, we have sorrow and grief and anxiety, depression, shame, and regret. We all have all of these things to some extent. And I'm not talking about, when I'm talking about anxiety and depression, I'm not talking about clinical. I'm talking about the fact that when you come into a facility like this, all right, we'll call it being bummed out. Are you not bummed out? All right, take a look at where you got yourself. 
where you've ended up, there should be some level of depression there. Okay, how about anxiety? Day one, you want to be better, right? Do we not have anxiety? Yes, we do. And again, I'm not talking about the, you know, chemical imbalances or anything like that. I'm just talking about the fact that we are a mess because of where we have gotten ourselves, because of the decisions that we have made. And now again, I'm not discounting the fact that some of these things have been put upon us. Some of us have had dysfunctional family relationships or we've been mistreated, we've been abused. And I'm not talking about that either, but that should still bring about anxiety, depression, shame, and regret. Okay? But when we come into a facility like this, we need, this is where it happens. This is where we deal with those things. This is where we take a searching and fearless moral inventory so that these things can be lifted. And I'm going to tell you a little trick here that I believe, and as we look at the scripture, that it is good sorrow. It is good grief. See, because these anxiety, depression, shame, regret, hurt, right, cannot be healed until we deal with it, until we work on it. So we can't allow our pride to get in the way of us communicating these things with the people that he puts in our lives. The sorrow and the grief, I believe, again, at one point in our lives we could care less of what we are doing. So we, we called out to God, God has brought us here, so now we have to look at these things, and if you're not sorrowful for the things that you've done, if you don't have grief over your life over the things that have caused you to be here, then you're not even started yet. You haven't even begun. You're still not even connected yet. God brings about these things. He says to us, look, man, you can't keep hurting yourself. I always say God kicks you in the butt, right? He kicked me in the butt in a way to get my attention enough. You see, it wasn't the death of my brother, the death of my best friend. It wasn't watching people fall down. It wasn't all those things. <clears throat> it wasn't until I became physically incapable of putting vodka in my body because my body just rejected it. My liver was messed up, and it's still messed up to some extent. That I was, I, that God finally kicked me in the head enough to say, "Wow, man, I need to do something." This was. Years after being in and out of programs and ARCs. Years. So God brought about that clear-mindedness enough to recognize what I had done. So there was sorrow and there was grief. And again, to some extent, we've all experienced all of these. And if you're sitting here this morning, you're dealing with a past that should cause grief. And it should bring sorrow. So again, the problem is we can't work through it because we're too busy acting like we got it all together. I got it all together. There are a lot of things that, you know, I know I talk about this a lot, but I, mean, I just, listening to war stories in the 12-step meeting just blows my mind sometimes. It's like, let's deal with the real thing. Let's, let's deal with the real hurt. Not about how you, you were able to do this and you were able to do that. And you, you know, let's deal with it. On the other end, and I always like to make sure I include both ends, the other mistake that we make is self-condemnation. We may have given up. So you're either too puffed up or too beat down, one or the other, right? But either way, we have to deal with this. And, and, it, and it will require you to be fearless. God is with you. You hear me? God is with you. I'm not going to tell you that 
God will never give you anything that's too much to handle because that's not true. God will give you things that will require His presence for you to be able to handle. You hear me? God will give you things that you will need. You It will require you to be in communication with Him for you to handle. God will give you things that you will not be able to be fearless and handle unless you're looking to Him for the strength it will take to carry you through them. God gives us things so that we might know that our, <coughs> we need Him. That our reliance should be on Him and not man. His, our reliance should be on Him and not ourselves. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah. God will never give you things, something that's too hard to handle. It's not, it's not scriptural anyway. All right. Yeah. So our past hurts. And, and we're not weak because we have sorrow for our wrongs. It shows, right? It shows that we have started an important process. If we have sorrow, we at least recognize our wrongs. We can't get better unless we recognize the things that we have done. You can't change unless you're honest with yourselves. Fearlessly honest. And you recognize your mistakes. You have sorrow. I don't know. I, it was, I believe was it the, no, I don't think it was the first rehab I was in. It wasn't Living Grin. I think it was, um, oh, I forget which one it was. But anyway, uh, part, of the, part of that program, right, they bring in a coffin. And you have to write your own eulogy, right? And you, you lay in the coffin and you give a eulogy to somebody else and they read it. Anybody ever experienced anything like that? I know, I, 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 at least when I went through the program, the phase program, there was a thing in there where you had to draw a picture of the things that you were, like, you know. Anyway, so I drew the, the, the coffin. But man, we really do need to die of our old self. And we will have to mourn. How about that? We have to go through a mourning process when our life completely changes and we have to put our old life behind us. And that's not easy. That's not easy. Yes, our past hurts. And we're not weak because we have sorrow for our wrongs. It shows that we have started an important process. Again, and that is how healing begins. Constructive sorrow. And this is what it's all about. We all have to deal with sorrow. We might try to stuff it down and ignore it. We may try to drown it by giving in to our addiction or avoid feeling it by intellectualizing. But sorrow doesn't go away. We need to accept the sorrow that will be a part of the inventory process. Int intellectualizing. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think that's the hardest nut to crack when we get to a point where we think we know better. And what's crazier, when we get to a point where we think we know better than God, Okay, so here it is. You ready? Not all sorrow is bad for us. Remember, you have to go through a mourning process. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul had written a letter to the church in Corinth that made them very sad because Paul confronted them about something they were doing wrong. And again, nobody wants to be confronted. And, and the weird thing is, I, I think this is even more prevalent in today's society. Constructive criticism is really out the window in a lot of cases, and especially young kids. They don't want to hear it. But what's strange is, for us, who have really been in the gutter, literally, right? We have 
been behind bars, we have been in a hospital bed, some of us have been close to death, if not dead and brought back. <coughs> and yet we still find it hard to accept direction, to accept criticism, even when it's constructive criticism. At first, he was sorry that he had hurt them, but later said, now I'm glad. Sometimes we have to. Even when we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, let them know that they're killing themselves. Now I'm glad I said it. Not because it hurt you, but because, listen, the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. So the pain which we've experienced in life and trust me, it tells me in God's word that God will never tempt you to do something that's wrong. God will never tempt you to sin. But we've been through a lot, and we've been through a lot of pain. God has brought us through that and brought us here to this place at this time, at this moment, to speak to you through his word. So that you might recognize your sin. We all sin to some extent. That's why when I pray, I, I ask God to speak through me the message that each and every one of us needs to hear, including myself. Because the message for one might not be the same as the message for another because the pain is different than the pain, his pain. The sin is different than his sin. So the message might be different, but the message is all needed. And it comes down to one truth, that we are sinners and that God has a plan for our lives, which includes salvation through Christ Jesus. And after, even after that, he's going to start pointing out things through the Holy Spirit and through his word that you need to change. And again, yeah, yeah it ain't easy. And it's going to hurt. When we read God's word, and it, ready for this word? Convicts us of our sin. Know this, that Christ paid the price. So I read again. Now I'm glad I said it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. So that pain in my liver, that pain in my stomach that caused me to vomit every time I ate for the first year of being clean was a reminder that I can't do that anymore. That God has a better plan for my life. And that I needed to deal with that, but I also needed to make the changes in my life that needed to be made so that I could become the man that God created me to be. It might be physical pain, it might be emotional pain, it might be all kinds of, but we have to work through it and trust God in it so that we might grow. So listen to this. It was a kind of sorrow, yes. God wants his people to have. The kind of sorrow that God wants his people to have because God needs you to recognize in order for you to make the changes. <coughs> for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There is no regret, regret for that kind of sorrow. Just see what the godly sorrow produced in you. You show that you have done everything necessary to make things right. So again, if we're numb and we just don't care
We haven't even started yet. But God speaks to us in a way that we recognize our character defects, right? Our shortcomings. Right? Our, our, our moral uh, uh, fallacies, right? Our moral uh, uh, shortcomings. He points them out to us so that we might mourn, right? We might be sorrowful. We might have grief for the things that we've done, which then causes us to naturally want to mend that, to get beyond that, to put that behind us. Constructive criticism. So what holds us back? Well, we're afraid to deal with it. So we have to be what? Fearless in our searching within. Fearless. God convicts of our sin. This conviction causes sorrow. Then sorrow compels us to repent and seek forgiveness. Our past hurts. But dealing with it helps. Because as he tells us in his word, because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. We should have sorrow for the things we've done. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. We don't have to hide it. We can be fearless because there's no regret for that kind of sorrow. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us. We have to deal with what caused us to leave this place. We have to deal with our past honestly, openly with ourselves, with you, and at some point with someone else. Help us, Lord. Being completely honest with ourselves is even scary at times. We make up excuses as to why it's okay to still act out in ways that we know are wrong. But we're only adding to the sorrow and grief. Speak to us now, Father. Help us to know what you would have us to do this day. First and foremost, you made it possible for us to come out of our old life out of our old sinful nature. You've made it possible for us to come into a personal relationship with you through your son, Christ Jesus. And I pray, Father, for each person here this morning that they know this is true. It's a personal relationship. It's between you and, and the believer, each one of us individually. So as we come to you now, Father, I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that is yet to accept you as their personal Savior, that they recognize this need just now. They admit that they're sinners and there's nothing they can do to save themselves, but to accept Christ into their hearts as their personal Savior. To seek forgiveness. To repent of their past they ask you into their hearts, Lord, so that you might now then guide them. You draw us close. And you guide us. You lift us out of that mess, out of our old life. And you, you put us on firm foundation. And you steady us as we go through your Holy Spirit, through your Word. And you give us the strength and the courage it will take to make the changes that we need to make as you convict us of our sin, Lord. Help us to have the courage once again to let it go. And as you prompt us to do things that we've never done before for whatever reason we might think they're strange or help us to put aside our false pride and to do the things that you would have us to do. It's all simple things, but they're not easy. 
So give us the strength and the courage it will take to be fearless and to do the things that you would have us to do, to be the men that you created us to be. And in all this, I thank you through Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.